Uh, I've got no slides, so uh, I have to paint word pictures. Okay. Anyway, as someone connected to the Department of War Studies at King's College London, you might think that I would have a good idea about what militarization is. But the truth is just, uh, that just like a mirage, the closer you get, the further it disappears. However, let's start with an assumption that using the word militarization in connection with the illegal wildlife trade and conservation assumes that military themes are intersecting with uh, environmental protection needs often referred to as green militarization, the militarization of conservation, and sometimes the dark side of conservation. The implication here is that conservation responses are drawing on a wide reservoir, not only of kinetic military hardware, including guns and drones, but also military thinking and tactics, such as counterinsurgency. Additionally, the non-kinetic branches of enforcement range from eavesdropping and data mining to GPS tracking and time-honored human intelligence. Plus, there is the use of private security companies and armed forces in counter-poaching, including the British Army training ranges in Africa. For the sake of argument, let's call this enhanced wildlife protection. This approach is criticized from various directions from being too aggressive and endangering human life across to diverting valuable resources, both in human and financial terms, which could have been spent on community upliftment and conservation schemes, while various cultural, historical, and economic tropes like the legacy of colonialism and wealth inequality also appear. And somewhere in the middle of this great divide are the actual conservationists, field support staff, and rangers, often working in incredibly difficult situations, both geographically and operationally, and sometimes at great personal risk. In the short time available, I'm going to interrogate a few of the assumptions outlined to get a better picture of what elements are contained in the militarization debate. But I'm certainly, most certainly, not partisan to any one particular side. So I'm going to start by asking a simple question. What is the job of a conservationist? Is it to protect wildlife and humans, uh, uh, both, uh, uh, both at the same time, or just wildlife? You can decide that one. However, both wildlife and humans don't live on thin air. It's the land, their habitat, that they tread that allows them to live, and this needs protection. Unfortunately, a large proportion of biodiversity occurs in parts of the world where there is either fighting or conditions are unstable. <laughs> This is what we call fragile and conflict-affected states, FCAS. So if the control and use of land and habitat dictate conservation on one hand, then on the other hand, it is how humans protect this land that, that is the other dictating factor. And the methods used here forms the great divide between proponents and critics of enhanced wildlife protection. And now I'm briefly going to highlight some points related to the great debate. Firstly, from a war studies perspective, the word militarization, strictly speaking, describes the process by which society prepares for a war. And a classic example is here, Britain, in, in the run-up to the World War II. And running in parallel is the word securitization, whereby society takes active measures against the threat, such as terrorism. Secondly, the use of force within a militarized context does not have to be violent. Soft power uses threats and coercion without violence. Thirdly, while there is a tendency to inevitably focus on Africa and its megafauna, it is an intellectual sleight of hand to use these results to create a global argument against so-called militarization. There are many locations where any military-style hardware is not present, let alone guns being carried. So providing a uh, location and context is all important. Notwithstanding, in some of these countries, especially in parts of Africa, the carrying of weapons is a common cultural practice for a variety of reasons, and this applies to local rangers. In these countries, especially in the central areas of Africa, the risk of violent attack is ever-present, and guns provide protection, as well as making a statement about readiness. <coughs> Friends of mine working in these areas laugh and then get hot under the collar when it is suggested that rangers should not carry guns. Fourthly, 
Levels of so-called militarization is a reflection of the degrees of violence in a given country. This is what we call the culture of violence. And the fifth point, tougher law enforcement won't solve the problem. You have to involve the whole community. Point six, given that the, point, uh, the, the issue of militarization is clearly forming part of culture wars, it is important to clearly identify both who are making the arguments and what they are saying. Take South Africa in brief, heart of the militarization uh, debate. Issues of apartheid and colonialism feed into and out of questions around land ownership and resettlement, plus overwhelming social issues of health, wealth, and education. And this leads to the seventh and final point, which re relate, sorry, the seventh point, which relates to the blurring of national security and wildlife protection, most notably in Kenya and South Africa, especially in the Kruger Park with its border with Mozambique. Here, talk of what rhino was is conceptually ludicrous, but rhetorically significant as it encapsulates the overlap of human <coughs> and wildlife security issues. And I'm going to end with two broad interlocking points. Firstly, what is so-called militarization? While strictly speaking, it is not actually a strategy by itself, nor is it actually a tactic. But one might say that this is uh, being merely pedantic and actually, the use of enhanced conservation forms part of a wider strategy of wildlife protection. But we have to be much clearer about this. And my second related point is more profound and yet disturbing. In his work, De Rerum Natura, the Roman philosopher poet Lucretius warned that, warned that the bad treatment of animals was a reflection of human psychic disharmony, warfare being a reflection of this condition. With this in mind, for Lucretius, the slaughter of wildlife reflected the ultimate form of a negatively militarized state of mind, which was that mankind was at war with itself. Thank you. Thanks very much to um, our speakers. I'd now like to open it up for a sort of Q&A and discussion. Um, but I'd ask that people keep their questions short and clear so we can get as many people as possible in and say who you are when you uh, first speak. So, go ahead. Thanks, Rod. So, Keith Somerville from both Dice and the Centre of Journalism at Kent University. Taking up really one of your points, Rose, and some of the things that Bram said as well, about the way in which in the militarisation of conservation, arms companies can use conservation in order to test new weapon systems. Do you get the feeling at all, and I felt it came across in things Gavin Williamson, the British Defence Secretary, said when he was talking about the British deployment of troops to train rangers in Malawi and also Gabon, that there's an element of testing out mm -hmm. and getting trained <coughs> on the ground in African conditions, whether in Gabon, in denser forest areas, or in Malawi, in more thornbush and savannah areas, boots on the ground, if you like, training those boots on the ground for the possibility of counterinsurgency, given the continuing concerns over Boko Haram, which is now in this rather fake ivory insurgency narrative being linked to the ivory trade, I think, rather tenuously. Yeah. And then also fears perhaps about the Mozambique <coughs> branch of Al-Shabaab that has been, that has come into being. Okay. Do you think there is a link? Yeah. Bram, do you want to answer first and then I can, or? Um. Well, I mean, yes, there, there's a, that's a short answer. There is a link. Um, the way I found it out first was um, I did my PhD in 2003, 4, 5, uh, thereabouts, uh, and a colleague of mine did, did her PhD on uh, Israeli security services. And I did my PhD on peace parks. We had nothing in common, nothing. And now we're actually starting to work together. Because she's tracking uh, Israeli military companies, and she says that they are testing things out in and around in South Africa in different parks. So I was, of course, flabbergasted, and she's asking, she asked me whether we can do some field research together on this. So 
in all, I mean, it's hard to get exact details. I mean, from her, I do know Liz, Elizabeth Lundstrom is working on exactly this question and, and several others as well, but the links are there, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll briefly follow up on the, 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 the British Army. I mean, I think the Ministry of Defence and the UK Army have been very explicit and very clear that this is a two-way learning exercise, that it's not just about uh, British Army uh, training rangers, that it's also about the Army learning bush tracking skills that they have lost in the, the long and protracted wars in the Middle East. So I think we definitely do see that interaction. It's not just about the military moving into conservation, uh, sorry, conservation moving into more military strategies. It's also about the military trialing out uh, new strategies in, in the conservation space where it's perhaps less controversial because the public accept it as a, a, as a good and right thing to do. So we have a second question. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, Belinda Tambay from uh, University of Southern California, Los Angeles. So very uh, eye-opening set of presentations, uh, really great. <coughs> I wanted to uh, go to Bram for the, one of the last slides you put in and talked about short-term versus long-term. And whereas um, I agree about the longer term uh, prescriptions that you're providing, I'm not sure that in the short term that, you know, uh, that solution will work. And I wanted to just sort of get your thoughts. I don't know if I understood right, but were you suggesting that in the long run that's the way to go, but in the shorter term, uh, perhaps because uh, unless we act quickly, that there'd be nothing left. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, Maybe others first, or? I think initially, or do you, would you like to respond as well? Well, to go into detail <laughs> would take a bit long. Um, we spent like, yeah, the last two years really working this out. We have uh, a set of short-term um, propositions, fairly political and some longer term as well. One, one includes um, some, some on a more symbolic level. So moving away from the idea of protected areas to what we started calling promoted areas. Um, but the, I think the more important thing for us is the logic at this point. I mean, I, I, can, I mean I'm not gonna do the whole presentation here because that would take too much time away. Um, but the logic behind, behind the solutions, and it's the same as, as the logic behind the analysis, is that the logic that got us into this problem or into the mess in the first place can't be the one to get, to get us out. And yet we have to deal with it on the short term, exactly as you say. Right? And this is exactly where we need to become political. Right? So one of the things we're, we're suggesting, uh, amongst a couple of other things, is uh, a conservation basic income. Right? So in line with broader sort of gen generic basic income strategies, Right? Give people around protected areas a basic income, a ba you know, so conservation organizations should start you know, uh, helping to pay for that together with governments and others so that people can live locally defined lives and they can start becoming partners on a more equal basis with other actors uh, outside who are interested in conservation rather than being dependent on these kind of things. So that's, that's one of the sort of short term steps and we have several along that kind of logic to try to change, you know, the mindset. Um, we, we have several comments in the room. You, you were first and then second. If I can just ask, go ahead. Uh, Ross Hardy from the South African Institute of International Affairs. Um, one of the difficulties we found with our work, especially in community-based natural resource management kind of ideas and strategies, <coughs> is it's actually really difficult to come up with mechanisms to distribute revenue in a way that Mm -hmm. and is perceived to be fair by mm -hmm. these local communities that are on the front lines that are subject to all manner of exploitation and mm -hmm. etc. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I like the idea of, a, of an income grant, and I think that's probably going to have to be funded through some kind of global biodiversity tax or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how yeah. to get this to be funded, but have you thought about the actual mechanisms for distribution mm -hmm. Just 
go to the next question. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go on to the next question first because we've got quite a few stacked up in the room. Uh, I'm Marusa Ferma from Madagascar. Our case is a bit different. Uh, in Madagascar, uh, uh, our main problem is the government. Corruption, government, and then the Chinese people. Uh, I'm from the northeast of Madagascar. Uh, where is, uh, I don't know if you know about Maswala National Park and Makira Natural Parks. Uh, from, I'm from the play, uh, area where the two biggest national park in Madagascar. One is about 240,000 hectares of the primary rainforest, and the other is about 372,000 hectares of the rainforest. Our problem there is uh, the people from abroad came and they took the, the logs. You know about the Rosewood problem, because it's, uh, it's a very, very, it's, uh, many people know about our problem about, about the Rosewood. Even the story of the, uh, it's about 3,000 3, 3, 3, logs of uh, Rosewood in, in Singapore. Um, our problem, for, uh, I think, for Madagascar, you know, just to explain about the, the, the politics there. For example, Maswal is about very huge, only less than 70 person work on the conservation, include the watchmen in the office. And then the loggers with a lot of money from China, and then even the boss, the locally, the, the businessman from from Madagascar or from uh, the big town, they come to the rainforest, they use the guns. And the rangers without even macetes, they have no macetes. Uh, the same also, in, I think the Makira National Park, Makira Natural National uh, Parks, uh, the WCS, Wildlife Conservation Society, managed that park. I asked the, the, the boss before I came here, he said about how many how many people work for the for uh, Makira? He said about include the watchmen also 150, but uh, Makira is about 300 more than 300 hectare of uh, primary rainforest, and then there is, for example, the about wildlife trade because there is some uh, uh, the problem is for rosewood it's international uh, illegal trade. But there is also locally illegal trade, like uh, the timber, the wood for construction, and then also for the lemur. Lemur. Uh, you know, the, the, our problem also, I, I said a Chinese problem, because the Chinese, pro, the Chinese people, they eat everything. They come to the forest, and they suit the, for, they suit the lemur, and then they, they sell it to the, to the market. Uh, so, for us in Maswala, in the Makira, or Mama Bay, we said Mama, Mama Bay, we really need the help for conserving our rainforest because only the national park is very big, but we have more than one million thousand hectare of rainforest in Madagascar. The leftover of rainforest in Madagascar, most of, uh, of that is in, 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 in our area. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, do you want to respond to those points quickly? And, um, okay. And then we've got two more questions no, in the audience stacked up already. Charles, yeah. Yeah, but maybe he, he, has to, he has to answer that. I, that would not be, I don't have any possibility in answering that. Brian, you can answer that if you want. Um, so your name is Ross, if I remember correctly? Yes. Um, obviously, this is, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've worked in South Africa for a long time. So yes, I mean, this is incredibly uh, difficult. Um, <laughs> And the money might, might run out very short, even if you do a, right, like we indeed envision sort of a Tobin tax, what was originally proposed, but then for, for conservation. I mean, I mean, if you do it well, there will be plenty of money around, but, right, to first get it started, you know, at least on, on that side would be hard. Um, so we're principally thinking now in terms of finding a good, you know, balance between communities of use, people using it, and communities of place. Because if you just look at the one or the other, you miss a lot of people that still, in one way or the other, interact with. Uh, this is based on work by Alphonse Mosimane in, 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 in Windhoek, who actually really made that point. 
So we try to take that on board as a first sort of start, but always within a bigger sort of platform of, of broader sort of income and general income, or basic income IDs. So it shouldn't just be separate from that, but as part of that, in relation to the other, I mean, one, one other thing that we uh, try to do is sort of get a very broad overview of different classes of, of conservation actors, right? And I think Charles showed it pretty well in this, in this video, right? The, the, the people that we target are, are, are the people in the video. They need to change. So what we do in the book is we say, no, there are, there are at least four classes of conservation actors. The global elites that put most pressure on the economy that percolates down, right? Big landholders do pre pretty much the same thing. Global middle classes that don't necessarily, uh, they, don't, they don't subsist, you know, through natural resources, but through their consumption, right? And then they're sort of like mostly rural, lower, uh, sort of rural classes who either have, you know, subsistence forms of living and or market-based forms and all kinds of complex, right, in-betweens. Um, and just targeting those people, it's, it's not, we should actually also be targeting the other people. So what we want to do is make sure that they can voice their opinions, right, through at least being able to live to also, you know, hold the other actors into, uh, into account. Right? We look at them as saviors, oh, they're rich and they won't change in any event. No, but they put pressure on, our, on biodiversity. We should be targeting them as well, not just put all the you know, emphasis on, on that lower level. Um, I want to come back to one little point that I forgot, like the, the, the point about we need, we need to act now, otherwise nothing is left. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't do that anymore. Like, I, I, just, I, just, I, I feel I can't work like that. I can't think like that. If I just all the time feel like there's already all this pressure on all of us, right, to perform in whatever job we are in. There's an incredible pressure, and this is added on top of that. We will lose stuff. We will, right? It's, the apocalypse is not coming sometime in the future, right? As Eric Swingedow says, it's already here. Right? We have to live with it. We have to live with loss and in the process build another world. And that's for me a much more positive thing than thinking, oh, if we do something now, everything is lost. Or if we don't do something now, everything is lost. No, I don't. yeah, we will lose things, right? But if we just focus on then and base actions on then, we will lose much more. If we stop, you know, by being too focused on that, we can actually move onward for a more positive vision. I want to pass on to Charles. Who yeah, was and uh, I would like some to ask a, a little bit of thing to Brian's talking, just to say the key successfully uh, to tackle illegal wildlife trade is what we call consent. So if we even want to lead things in the forest, uh, the people surrounding, just like what the Africa Charter said, uh, before uh, you require a project on the land of indigenous people, you know, let's try, we have to require, we have to receive what we call free uh, uh, consent, uh, a free, proud, informed consent before the conservation can make something on the field. This is what I think is, uh -huh. yeah. Um, we have only about 10 minutes and there's already three questions on my list and it was, um, uh, Rosie first, and then you at the back, and then, yeah. Thanks, uh, so we'll take those three, and then if we've got more time, I'll take the other questions. The Hi, thanks very much, Rosaline. My question is to Charles. Yeah. Um, and getting back to the question of effectiveness. So, Charles, you've highlighted the incredibly harsh impacts of more coercive <laughs> conservation techniques on indigenous people. But some people will, will respond to that by saying, oh, well, it's harsh, but it works, and at this point in time, we need it. Could you actually comment on the local mm. effectiveness of those conservation <laughs> approaches um, and perhaps comment on what you think would be a more effective approach in the place where you live? Thank you. Yeah, Rosie, this is what I said. Yeah? Can I take the other questions yeah. first because we're running out of time, but hold, okay. hold your answer for, okay. for a, just for a moment. Do you want to? shot downtown maybe, where many people can see what happened, what transpired. They 
Do you want me to answer now? No, no, yeah. You can hold the, the answer and then we have one more at the front here. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to <coughs> maybe to the whole researchers. I'm Ramson Karmushu from Kenya. Uh, uh, I, I like the, the, the discussion about the holding about mil mit militarization of uh, conservation. But my question goes to um, to the researchers, if they have done any studies concerning how the militarization is, how the military is, or the rangers are being hired, uh, and do you think, mm -hmm. uh, if you've done th this in your studies, are they also participating in the uh, poaching and the illegal life trade? Uh, because to me and to my views, I think they are. And again, uh, the, that thing is, they hire them, yes, and how do they, if they want to resign, do they really resign and go back to the community? And do they go there and still support conservation or they fight the way back? Or how are they, how are they made sure that they don't resign and go back to the community? So briefly, um, yeah. if we can get Charles first, uh, please. Yeah, uh, to raise Rosie's question, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, the community must be aware of their rights, let's say, for example. And then uh, about the necessary details of the project that will be, yeah, what they are agreeing to. If, uh, if conservation want to do their work, they have to go nearer uh, to the communities and then they tell the communities, this is what we want to do. They don't have to be the community should be scapegoating. They have to be based and tell the community this is what, and they have to get the consent of the communities to see whether communities allow their project. If the communities hate their project, they will tell them. But when they force them, and they, you know, they use force on the communities, the communities will be scapegoating. That's one of the parts I've been tell to Rosie. This is what I can reply. Jasper. Yeah, no, uh, I think it's, um, yes, it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, 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 question to answer. And um, I just think that uh, the whole militarization debate is, fraught with these uh, problems about how we view the Western uh, mentality imposing our thinking upon the countries where we, which is a completely different culture. And I think this is one of the key aspects, and it's going to come back to that with the, the answer to that. And uh, until we really resolve that more clearly, that problem, I don't think we are going to get much clearer of the answer. So... Uh, I'm going to sit on the fence a little bit at the moment, but I'll come bit, answer a bit more a bit later on. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, okay, I'll, I'll follow on for the, uh, to answer your question about the use of guns. Um, again, just to repeat what I've just said about uh, imposing our Western liberal attitudes on the, uh, countries that uh, are very, very different uh, uh, to us. Um, and so, I, who am I to tell? Kenyans how to run their wildlife. Uh, you know. Of course I've got my views and I'd rather not they, uh, carry guns. But I do notice in this whole debate that the guys who really get left out of the picture are the rangers. And I've, been, I've talked to people and they, uh, who look after them. They say a lot of these guys are suffering from post-traumatic stress the, the, and they are really bottom of the food chain. And these are the guys who are at the sharp end who actually get the least amount of support. So I, my answer to the question is, ask the ranger, do they want to carry the gun or do they not? Because they are the guys who are going to have to face, the, face it in the bush. That's my answer. Very briefly, I have a PhD student, Emil Smith. He's absolutely brilliant, and he's been uh, in the Kruger Park for over a year. He was a ranger for about 20 years, 
and he's now doing his PhD on ranger experiences of militarization. So he's been in the Kruger Park for over a year, um, actually going out with rangers to see the effects uh, on them. So uh, I can definitely get you guys in touch if you want. He's got a lot to say about that. Um, I think maybe we've got time for one more question. I think you, the woman at the back had a, your hand up next. And then, and then I think we'll have to end because we're cut into the next plenary. Which is Hmm. I had a student actually look into that. She spent uh, four months with the Black Mambas and she came to quite the opposite conclusion. Yeah. Right? So it's, yeah, I don't know if many people know it, but the Black Mambas is an all-female, all-black uh, anti-poaching unit in South Africa. Works in, so they're not allowed to carry guns, for example. If they run into lions, I also did patrols with them. If they run into lions or anything, they have to call others to quickly come and protect them. And they're actually in a very tricky situation. Right? And some of, I mean, of course, they're different. They're, they're all different individuals. And some of them enjoy it more than others. Um, but there are certainly some real problematic issues in terms of them, you know, being, you know, very much used. Why do we pay attention to that? It's ex exactly because we don't expect it, right? And, and in the field, they actually have very little uh, actual power, right? It, it's run by a group of white South Africans and, and Westerners, um, and they are in a very, quite a subservient position in that, plus many of them can't really tell you know, the home front what they're doing because they would risk you know, uh, antagonism back home when they say, oh, you're working for the white uh, wildlife people. Right? So they're, they're in quite an quite a interesting, precarious situation. There are also good things about it. I mean, I think the leadership there is quite good in supporting them and trying to get them to also voice their own ideas about this, but they're still in a very sticky uh, position. I mean, I, I think it's a, it, it's a really important question that actually is, is often overlooked in our discussions of conservation practice, not just militarization, but conservation across the board, the kind of politic, the hidden politics of race and gender um, that's in there, you know, who's actually in control and who's driving conservation policy, where does it come from, what kinds of ideas are embedded in it, not just about, wild, <coughs> about those who might be engaged in poaching or those who might be engaged in wildlife protection, but also about who constitutes the consumer. So, you know, as, as part of our team, there are um, two researchers who are working on the role of Europe in the illegal wildlife trade, which are very overlooked uh, uh, dynamics. We focus on elephants, we focus on tigers, but Teresa's there in, in the front who works on the Balkan bird trade. Uh, and we also have Hannah who works on um, the caviar trade in Europe. And that's, again, another area that's often overlooked and the sort of focus on charismatic species and what you know, the kind of wealthy world is interested in conserving is what often gets the, grabs the headline attention. And then we get the headlines around all women anti-poaching units. But when you dig into it, we need to look at who's actually driving that, who's in control, are they in control, is it as emancipatory um, as it was really, as it's really presented um, to be. But um, I'd like to kind of just finish up um, the panel by... Um, by saying thanks very much to all of you and to our speakers. I think there's a really important debate to be had around our uh, sort of sense of urgency and how that might start to produce a, a, an enhanced willingness and capacity to use violence. Um, and I think as the conservation community, and I count myself as part of that, need to address that and take ownership of it and not dodge responsibility by kind of saying, well, we're, we're neutral and we're just supporting what's, what works. By not speaking out about the negative effects, that in itself is, an, is a political act by omission. I think we do need to be 
um, clear about the, sort of the, the politics of wildlife conservation, about the racial politics of it, and about the gender politics as well. But I'll, I'll just finish off by saying thanks very much to all three of our speakers, and do come and talk to all of us uh, during the breaks. We're more than willing to talk. So thanks very much.